Over the years, uh, the habits of mind have been researched and tested in schools, and uh, we have found beneficial effects in many, many different ways. Um, some are anecdotal and some are um, research-based uh, with uh, highly controlled groups and so on. So we, we have both kinds of research. Uh, anecdotal research is probably the most powerful, mainly because uh, we have seen it collected over the years as well as around the world, and there seems to be a rather consistent pattern. Um, one is the uh, observations of teachers in the classroom of what happens to students when they learn the, the habits of mind. And we find, first of all, that students truly understand and utilize the terminology. And we have reports from teachers who are truly amazed, even with very little children, um, in that they can utilize the terminology and apply it to their understanding, and they are aware of when they use the habits of mind. They recognize it in others. Um, they, um, uh, they start using the habits of mind as a basis for their own work. And a kid will say, you know, I really persisted on that task, or I forgot to manage my impulsivity, or I'm thinking interdependently. And so the students utilize the terminology, and that's been very consistent finding over time. Another bit of anecdotal uh, evidence that we have is what happens to uh, school staffs. And uh, this takes quite a bit of time, but as a staff um, begins to utilize the habits of mind across all of the grades and with all classes, uh, something happens in the culture of the school. And the staff begins to work together. They begin to share a common vision. Uh, the habits of mind pervade the culture of the school. They become the norms of the school and schools begin living the habits of mind. We've seen this happen in many, many instances where um, habits of mind have been adopted and implemented over a lengthy period of time. And so, um, so not only do students use the habits of mind, and the, and the anecdotal research shows that, but also the culture of the school. We also have a lot of uh, anecdotes from teachers who tell about what the habits of mind mean to them how they are becoming more uh, efficient, uh, efficient, how they are asking better questions, for example, how they are monitoring their own uh, clarity and precision of language, how they are thinking interdependently with other teachers. And so not only does it pervade the culture of the school, but it also uh, influences teachers individually. We've even had uh, teachers tell us about how it affects their married life, <laughs> their inter interaction with their spouses, of course. And so, uh, on the one hand, we have a lot of anecdotal references um, about the habits of mind and their effects. What makes the anecdotes powerful, not any one among themselves, but it's the consistency and the universality of it. And so, the schools that we have worked with in Australia and New Zealand and the United States and the UK and Hong Kong and Singapore, uh, as we uh, expand around the world, we're finding that consistent. And so in that way, it is very powerful research. And so while it is not documented with research numbers, it is documented in the fact that it is consistent across many, many installations. And that really is what makes the anecdotal um, research powerful. Furthermore, uh, we have had some very highly uh, controlled experiments uh, in which we have looked at um, um, growth of students and their uh, attributes of the habits of mind and their effects on teachers. One that stands out is one done in North Carolina. And uh, this research was with gifted underachievers. These were students in the first three grades, kindergarten, first, and second year. And these were from schools that in rural North Carolina. They came from impoverished schools with a lot of ethnic minorities. And uh, in the history of these schools, there have been very few gifted children identified. And so the Department of Public Instruction of North Carolina says there's something wrong. Uh, this can't be that there are so few gifted children being identified from these environments. Let's do something to uh, see if we can't uh, identify more of them. And so Ben Akalik, my co-author, and I worked for three years with uh, teachers uh, from these schools 
in kindergarten, first and second grade. So the children had three years of habits of mind training. We also had a control group in which no training was given with the habits of mind. Um, at the end of the third year, these children went on to third grade. Now in New North Carolina, uh, children are identified as gifted in the third, by the third grade teacher. And so what the controlled experiment was to look at the number of students who were identified as gifted in the habits of mind group as compared with those in the control group who had no habits of mind. We found that 30% of the students from the habits of mind group were identified and recommended for gifted education, whereas only 10% of the um, uh, students from the non-habits of mind group were recommended. And so uh, this was startling because never had they had that many students um, being recommended before. So there was something going on there. E it was either in the perception of the teachers uh, about the behaviors of the students from the Habits of Mind group that they said, uh, you know, this is, this is different. These kids are doing something different. They're much more mature. They were metacognitive. Furthermore, uh, students at these three grade levels were observed in classroom. They were interviewed and uh, they were, uh, videotapes were taken of them interacting with their other students. They found not only did they use the vocabulary of the habits of mind, but they actually did become better problem solvers, uh, more clear and precise in their language, uh, uh, um, more um, thoughtful and less, ma less impulsive in their responses. And so these were classroom observations that were done as part of this research. So that's very compelling. That tells us something. Um, another bit of research that was done recently was to see if the habits of mind were robust enough to uh, stay with students as they left a school and went on to a school, uh, a higher school, that uh, did not teach the habits of mind. And so here was an elementary school that had been teaching the habits of mind for six years. And then these same students went on to middle school or high school and uh, the follow-up research was done to see if those students uh, sustained the habits of mind after they left elementary school. Well, uh, as a matter of fact, they did. They still used the vocabulary. But the researcher said vocabulary is not enough. Do they actually use the habits of mind? And so the researcher gave students problems to solve to see if they did persist, if they did come up with alternative strategies, if they did generate creative ways of solving problems. And they made a comparison between the habits of mind kids and other students at the middle school who did not have the habits of mind. And yes, the habits of mind students did indeed not only know the habits of mind, but also applied them spontaneously. And so uh, what we're really finding is that more and more research is supporting the habits of mind. There's something there that's very powerful, not only in terms of using the vocabulary, but in having the students begin to um, employ and apply the habits of mind as a, as a guide to their behavior and their actions and their thinking.